And I call on Rosanna Cunningham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to update Parliament today on the progress that Scotland is making in tackling climate change. Scotland's transition to a low-carbon economy is well underway. In 1990, Scotland emitted 76 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. Statistics published today show that in 2016 that number had almost halved to 39 million tonnes. That's a reduction of 49%. Scotland continues to outperform the UK as a whole in delivering long-term emission reductions. And amongst Western European countries in the EU15, only Sweden has done better. This achievement has been a national endeavour requiring effort across the whole of Scotland in every community, home and organisation. Today's statistics are testament to everyone who has made changes to their personal or business behaviour. Those changes are making a real difference. In terms of how we are progressing against Scotland's current statutory targets under this Parliament's 2009 Act, the statistics published this morning show emissions are down 45%. These targets are set on an adjusted emissions basis, which reflects the operation of the EU emissions trading scheme in Scotland. On this basis, Scotland has not only met the 2016 annual target, but is again exceeding the level of the current interim 2020 target of a 42% reduction. Given that our existing statutory targets lie at the most ambitious end of current international pledges to 2030, and we are making sustained progress in meeting them, I am sure you will agree with me that this is good news. However, there is always scope for improvement in the current reporting of climate targets. For this reason, the new Climate Change Bill proposes that all future targets will be set and reported using actual emissions rather than the emissions adjusted for the EU emissions trading scheme. A further issue members will recall from previous years is the technical revisions to the data which happen as measurement science evolves. Decisions about these data revisions are made at a UK level in line with UN guidelines. As has become customary, the statistics published today contain substantial revisions to the past data, mainly in the forestry sector. These revisions have worked in our favour, effectively making targets relatively easier to meet than was the case last year. But in most previous years, revisions have gone the other way. They have made targets harder to meet. And overall, the effect of revisions to date has made those targets harder. This illustrates how important it is to ensure that target outcomes reflect on the ground actions and are not determined purely by technical changes. The new bill implements recommendations from the Committee on Climate Change on this issue. The measurement methods used for reporting target outcomes will be frozen from the time the target levels were last reviewed. This will help ensure that technical changes alone don't determine whether targets are met or indeed missed. These shifts will improve transparency and enable government to be held to account, something I know that Parliament is always keen to do. The statistics published this morning demonstrate that Scotland is halfway through its low carbon transition. We must build on that momentum and the global consensus enshrined in the UN Paris Agreement and commit to doing even more. Through our climate change bill, we are not only providing solutions to our country's needs and interests, but also putting Scotland in the global vanguard. We are one of the first countries to set new statutory targets based on independent expert advice in line with the global aims of the Paris Agreement. The bill will mean that Scotland has the world's most ambitious statutory 2050 target based on domestic actions alone. The interim targets for 2020, 2030, and 2040 
will be the most ambitious statutory targets for those years anywhere in the world. Scotland will also remain the only country to have statutory annual targets, allowing Parliament to hold governments to account each and every year. This means there can be no delay to increasing action. Presiding officer, there is no doubt that these new statistics demonstrate substantial and substantive progress. But they also show where we need to be mindful of consequences. Since 1990, energy supply emissions are down 69% and waste and industry have also seen substantial reductions. In particular, the closure of the Longanet power station in March 2016 has had a substantial impact. The move to low carbon energy is the right one, but we must also reflect on those who were employed at Longanet. This shows very clearly that the low carbon transition involves and will continue to involve very real impacts on people, jobs and local economies. There will be many co-benefits, but there will also be genuine challenges. That's why we need to take a balanced approach to meeting our climate, social and economic priorities. The transition to a low carbon economy requires transformative change, but that change must always also be fair and inclusive. It is intended that the Just Transition Commission, which uh, this government will bring into being, will explore these admittedly difficult issues and advise on continuing the transition in a way that promotes cohesion and equality. The form that the Commission will take and its membership are currently being considered and will be announced later this year. The emission statistics also show where we need to make more progress, particularly transport and buildings. This government is already focused on tackling these issues. The Switched On Scotland roadmap outlines plans to increase uptake of electric vehicles and Scotland is taking the lead in promoting the use of ultra low emission vehicles and phasing out the need for new petrol and diesel cars and vans by 2032. The route map for Energy Efficient Scotland published last month sets out our vision that by 2040, all buildings in Scotland are warmer, greener and more efficient. And turning to the issue of net zero, let me be absolutely clear. This government wants to achieve net zero emissions as soon as possible. Crucially, I want to get there through responsible, credible legislation, plans and action. We need to maintain Scotland's momentum because without a doubt, the actions needed to reduce emissions in the future will be much tougher than those of previous decades. I don't want Scotland to just reduce its emissions. I want us to reduce emissions in a way that supports sustainable and inclusive growth and a fairer society. The transformation to a low carbon economy must benefit all. Otherwise, it could commit Scotland to approaches that will reduce food production, limit connectivity and jeopardize jobs. That sort of dislocation would be neither responsible nor sustainable in the long term. I also believe that Scotland's transformation should be built upon the strengths of this parliament's 2009 act. Setting a target beyond 90% now would mean reducing the integrity of our approach, for example, by purchasing international credits, removing sectors from our targets, or relying on future technology that cannot be set out now for scrutiny. For these reasons, the bill supports our commitment to achieve net zero emissions as soon as possible, but does not set a fixed date for this. The bill ensures that there is a requirement to have regard to the regular independent expert advice that will be provided on target levels, including the specific issue of a net zero date. As soon as the evidence indicates that there is a credible pathway to net zero, we will use the mechanisms in the bill to set the earliest achievable date in law. The moral, scientific and economic case for global action on climate change is clear and Scotland has risen to this challenge. The statistics published this morning clearly demonstrate 
the strong progress Scotland continues to make in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The actions to date are working. The commitments already made and in development will help make further and faster progress. The proposals in this government's climate change bill will help Scotland remain a world leader on tackling climate change and enable Scotland to become a fair and just low carbon society. Thank you very much. We're allowed just under uh, 20 minutes for questions. Uh, Donald Cameron to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Donald Cameron. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance notice of our statement and also refer to renewable energy and agriculture in my register of interests. As a party committed to protecting the environment and tackling climate change, the Scottish Conservatives welcome today's announcement and the progress made on climate emissions. And we specifically welcome the announcement of the Just Transition Commission. However, the publication of these statistics do provide us with an opportunity to discuss broader issues surrounding climate change. And it is important to acknowledge that in many quarters, it has been felt that both the climate change plan and the recently published bill are not robust or ambitious enough. Similarly, we note that while significant progress has been made in bringing down emissions in energy production, there has been little movement in transport and residential emissions, as to be fair, the Cabinet Secretary recognises in her statement. But these benches agree with Stop Climate Care Scotland, who say that we must use this opportunity to discuss what more we can do to tackle climate change. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary what more can be done to reduce emissions in areas like transport, which is the largest emitting sector, and will the government use this as an opportunity to strengthen the bill so that we can meet our climate change obligations? Cameron Secretary. Can I thank Donald Cameron for his question? Um, I've outlined, I think, in the statement why I believe that what we are proposing in terms of the climate change bill uh, is ambitious. Um, I did acknowledge that there are sectors of the economy uh, that have not made uh, the same uh, uh, strong level of progress as other sectors, but I don't suppose any of that comes as an enormous uh, surprise to anybody. Uh, what more can be done? Um, well, I think there's a very great deal more that is already being done. I would remind members in the chamber that these are the stats which relate to 2016. Since 2016, there's been some very considerable changes in terms of transport policy, huge commitments made, and a lot of work currently being done on, for example, low emission zones. Now, it's not my portfolio area of interest, but I know a transport bill has just been published yesterday, and I expect there will be quite a vigorous debate within the context of that going through Parliament, which will relate to some of the things that we are talking about today. So I believe in terms of, uh, of transport, this government has already made some significant commitments uh, that will change the future in terms of transport emissions when we come to see the 2017 stats and the 2018 stats and the 2019 stats. Um, I think there's a tendency to forget there is a two-year time lag in these stats. Um, the same with buildings. There's a very big commitment made by this government in terms of energy efficiency over a number of years. And that, of course, will begin to be reflected in, in future stats as well. So there is a lot of work being done uh, to increase the uh, ambition and is likely to have a very significant effect on emissions reductions, precisely in the sectors where we think at the moment uh, there is still a lot to do. And Claudia Beamish to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for prior sight of the statement, and I do welcome the fact that we have met this year's targets. It is a complex picture, and this gives confidence in the possibilities of what Scotland can achieve when climate policy is driven by ambitious long-term and interim targets. Will the Cabinet Secretary look again at the claim that the draft bill's targets are the world's most ambitious as they stand at the moment? Much of the emissions reduction is from the deployment of renewables in the, the electricity sector. And I'd like to know what lessons the Cabinet Secretary thinks we can learn from that and how we can apply it to sectors where emissions aren't yet falling enough, transport, residential buildings and agriculture, which he does not highlight as one of the areas of concern in the statement. And the Scottish Government in, um, could be considering, in our view, more robust policy to support farmers and mandatory action. And will the Cabinet Sec Secretary commit today to dialogue with the Cabinet Secretary for, rural, um, for the Rural Economy um, to address this issue? Uh, I, I thank Claudia Beamish for her, uh, for her question. 
Um, I, I won't repeat what I've just said about transport and, and, and buildings. I, I don't see much purpose in just being repeating there. Um, I'm glad actually the member raised the issue of agriculture because um, one of the difficulties with agriculture is a lot of the emissions, most of the emissions in agriculture are not actually carbon emissions, uh, uh, the residual emissions, the methane uh, and things like that. So um, the tackling of those is a very different uh, matter than the decarbonising that takes place, for example, in the energy sector that she, uh, that she referred to and wanted to use uh, as an example. I think it's probably fair to say that we will decarbonise energy uh, um, uh, much sooner than we will be able to reduce emissions from agriculture because the total uh, uh, reduction of emissions in agriculture would effectively be no food production. And we cannot be in a position where that's what we're talking about. She can rest assured that I have vigorous conversations frequently with my colleague uh, in the rural economy portfolio. Um, but I do uh, understand and accept some of the challenges that are in the agriculture sector uh, and will be in the future if we set targets that are far too high and unable to be achieved other than by reducing food production in Scotland, which in my view would not assist us uh, either nationally or indeed globally. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Maurice Golden. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could uh, outline her view on trade agreements after Brexit and the effect they might have on our approach to climate change, especially with regard to the relatively recent departure of the United States uh, from the Paris Agreement, which suggests that uh, the administration there has no interest in understanding of the effects of climate change. Um, I, I could say that's asked and answered uh, uh, by Stuart Stevenson. It, it is the case that we may be in a situation post-Brexit uh, where trade agreements that the UK might arrive at are not uh, ones which will help us in terms of uh, reduction of emissions. We, we don't know what's going to happen. We're not certain what they will hold. They could end up leading to increased emissions from the goods and services we import for, for example, the reason uh, which Stuart Stevenson has uh, alluded to. The, the truth is that membership of the EU and its single market provides Scotland with access to climate-friendly trade with our neighbouring countries, which I think everybody would accept is the most sensible way to proceed. Morris Golden to be followed by Alec Rowley. Given the closure of Longanet, has the Scottish Government considered what impact the transition to a decarbonised energy supply might have in the event of a black start event? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I think the reason that we're talking about the Just Transition Commission is because we do want to make absolutely sure uh, that what we're doing in all sectors, including the energy sector, uh, does uh, manage things for our population socially, economically, as well as in terms of emissions reductions and targets. Uh, and what the, what the member is, uh, is alluding to there is the kind of thing that is almost impossible to factor into what the future might hold and is why we have to be incredibly careful how, how we plan forward. Um, I, I think we've done incredibly well in terms of the energy sector, but the closure of Longanet does show, it's a sort of microcosm, of some of the things that uh, can happen, can go wrong uh, in the future. Uh, I'm not saying that was the wrong thing, but it is jobs, it is, it is a local economy, it is, it is an important aspect of how we plan for the future. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, I, and the inability to have a, a kind of 2020 foresight, uh, we all wish we could, but we don't. Alex Rowley, followed by Graeme D. To follow on from that, these figures are the first to show the impact of Long Gannett closing, as has been said. That's been good for our climate, but the only just transition support the Scottish Government offered was at the moment of crisis for those workers and for those communities. Moving to lower emissions requires us to plan and support workers in the just transition stages, as the Cabinet Secretary has said. Doesn't that mean we need a just transition commission that is long term and with a powerful legal basis in the climate change bill and that we also need an industrial strategy that takes us to a low carbon future in consultation with affected workers and communities across Scotland? Well, the Just Transition Commission uh, will actually, when it is set up, 
provide the kind of conversation that the member uh, undoubtedly, as I do, think is absolutely necessary. Um, Longanit is a, a, a kind of case study uh, of, what, uh, um, uh, of what might be required. Um, the member's asking that we put the Just Transition Commission into statute, but I don't think he's taking on board how long it would then take to get that commission up and running if we do that. Um, I hope to be uh, making an announcement later this year, uh, and that would be considerably in advance of any statutorily based uh, Just Transition Commission uh, that he might envisage. So I, I would rather get us moving sooner rather than later. Graham Day to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As we've heard, uh, today's statistics show that Scotland's outperforming many other countries and in doing so providing a leadership example. But can I ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, how important a role international cooperation has been and will be in tackling climate change? Well, international cooperation on climate change is absolutely uh, vital. Um, this is happening through the UN Paris Agreement. And we are proud to be one of the first countries to enshrine the increased commitment required by the Paris Agreement into domestic legislation. Um, following the introduction of the new climate change bill, members uh, might wish to know that we've received a letter from Laurent Fabius, president of the Paris Climate Conference, welcoming the bill as a, quote, very positive step, unquote, and, quote, a concrete application of the Paris Agreement, unquote. Now, international uh, cooperation isn't just about the actual moves towards climate change uh, mitigation. It's also about climate justice. The, this government has put a great deal of money into a climate justice fund, helping to, to mitigate and tackle the effects of climate change in the poorest, most vulnerable countries in the world. Every country does need to decarbonize their own economy and society in a way that works for them. And many of the changes to technology and infrastructure that will be necessary to achieve net zero emissions can only be developed with multinational cooperation. And the Scottish Government does collaborate with other high ambition states and regions through the Under Two Coalition. And the First Minister has signed an MOU with the Governor of California as a fellow member of the coalition. All of that international action is incredibly important, but I am particularly pleased to see the new climate change bill being uh, given uh, that kudos and that credibility by somebody as important as Laurent Fabius. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you. Um, following on from that question, the Cabinet Secretary has spoken a lot over the last 18 months about the need to keep pace with the European Union. But if the EU set a net zero target, as is being discussed by both the European Parliament and the Commission at the moment, would the Scottish Government use that as a reason to set a net zero target for Scotland? Well, I, I think uh, Mark Ruskell is in that category of people that want me to have 2020 foresight. There is a lot of discussion uh, around net zero, and I understand that. I understand why people want to have these conversations. But a closer look at what's proposed in various jurisdictions suggests a widely varying uh, approach to how that net zero uh, might be reached. In many cases, not legislatively. Uh, and in other cases, by excluding all sorts of things that we do include in our legislation. What the EU may or may not come out with in the future, I don't know, I can't be certain. I will, however, follow their discussions very carefully indeed, as I would expect all governments to do. Uh, and I would hope that they are also looking at the conversations that we are having. Lee MacArthur to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Thank you very much. Uh, can I too thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of her statement, uh, welcome the uh, confirmation that we have achieved the target, but also thank uh, her for a recognition of the significant amount of work that still needs to be done in the areas both of building and of transport. She pointed earlier on in, in response, I think, to Donald Cameron about the lag effect. Uh, I think in relation to, to transport, it's fair to say the government's proposals uh, on tax cuts for airlines and now the support for the third runway at Heathrow uh, are, are what have happened in the interim since these figures were applied. So why should aviation get a free pass and what message does it send uh, to those in other sectors working hard to make emission savings uh, to achieve the targets she set out? Cabinet Secretary. Well, if aviation is, uh, of course, sits within the transport sector and uh, I would anticipate that this is one of the uh, sectors where, and I certainly hope, uh, that uh, there are technological changes in the future that make uh, things considerably uh, uh, more manageable in terms of emissions reductions. But I think it's important to keep aviation emissions in perspective. Aviation currently accounts for less than 5% 
of total Scottish emissions based on these new 2016 stats. So uh, there, you know, there is a challenge uh, around aviation, but some of the things that I've said in my responses earlier uh, about growing the economy, uh, about impacts, uh, have to be taken on board in respect of this as well. Uh, and I think it's uh, important that people consider uh, that if there is to be a challenge in terms of aviation, how many fewer flights do we want coming in and out of Scotland? How many fewer flights do we want internally in Scotland? These are things that would have to be addressed by some of those questions. Now, I'm not saying that uh, to dismiss what the member has said. I know the member is asking a very genuine question, but there is a really genuine conversation that needs to be had about Scotland's wider economy and connectivity as well as, uh, as the emissions reductions aspect of this. Uh, technical emissions reductions can be achieved, but that would exclude some of the economic social consequences of those, uh, of those reductions. Uh, and I think we need to think very carefully into the future about how that is all managed. Angus MacDonald to be followed by David Stewart. Thank you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that some organisations and NGOs have called on the Scottish Government to set a net zero target in law now. Uh, as Sweden has done, and I, no I note her comments uh, earlier regarding a credible pathway to net zero. However, should Scotland be minded to adopt the legislative approach of Sweden, what would be the financial impact on the Scottish Government's budget uh, and uh, the further impact on our economy if it did? Well, I think it's important to point out that the 2009 legislation did set out a very distinctive Scottish approach to the low carbon transition. Uh, and that included a strong focus on fair and just action to reduce emissions here in Scotland and statutory annual targets to ensure governments are held to account each and every year on the way to 2050. Scotland is the only country in the world to do this. Our approach is working. We continue to outperform the UK as a whole in delivering emissions reductions and to rank highly internationally. Now, we could adopt Sweden's legislative approach. Of course we could. We could put a date on the bill. But it would also mean removing our annual targets because they don't have annual targets. It would uh, perhaps mean substantially reducing the ambition and coverage of our interim targets and allowing for up to 15% of the final target to be met through international credits. The financial impact would be in the region of £15 billion over the period until 2050, money that would need to be found from other areas of Scottish Government budgets. Now, it's not the case that one approach to targets is better than the other, and I do applaud Sweden's ambition. However, this government's view is that the distinctive features of Scotland's 2009 Act should be retained and strengthened. Okay, I'm conscious we've got four more questioners. Not at a lot of time. We may not get them all in. But David Stewart to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary stated that all future targets will be set and reported using actual emissions, not EU emission trading scheme adjusted statistics. Is this change due to the UK's likely withdrawal from the EU ETS? Um, not directly, no. Um, we wanted to do this because we think it's the right thing to do in terms of transparency and accountability. It doesn't actually uh, change our support for participation in the EU ETS in any way. Um, emissions trading is devolved under the 2008 UK Climate Change Act, and we do hope to be fully involved in the decision-making around EU ETS. Uh, re regrettably, despite repeated efforts to get responses out of the UK government, we haven't been able to have any formal discussion about that. But the shift to actual emissions accounting under the bill is about improving transparency and reporting only, and it isn't linked to uh, what might or might not happen to the EU ETS. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what would be the resultant effect in jobs and uh, in traditional industries and therefore local economies, bearing in mind that some organisations have portrayed the 90% target by 2050 as not being ambitious? Well, a 90% reduction target for all greenhouse gases means net zero emissions of carbon dioxide in Scotland by 2050. And I think some people have overlooked that, that the 90% uh, overall uh, uh, target includes within it net zero on carbon by then. So, uh, you know, and it's interesting that New Zealand, for example, who is, uh, ha has a headline uh, in, uh, indication that they want to go to net zero is consulting. And one of the things they're consulting on is net zero on carbon only. So, you know, I think there's perhaps around and about this discussion, a, a bit of a misunderstanding. So I think it's important uh, for us to say that. 
Uh, according to the Committee on Climate Change, achieving 90% reduction in all greenhouse gases will require the near total decarbonisation by 2050 of energy supply, ground transport and buildings. So that's what we are uh, anticipating. That means transformational change and challenging actions. But by far the largest source of emissions in the CCC's 2050 scenario, and that's actually at 2050, will be agriculture, which, as I've already said, is not the same as other sectors, and that needs to be recognised. You can't produce food without emitting greenhouse gases like methane. So setting a net zero target for all greenhouse gases before the evidence exists to support this could mean reducing the amount of food produced in Scotland without reducing greenhouse gases at the global level. Finlay Carson. Overall, the statement released today shows a positive trend in reducing emissions, and my colleagues and I on these benches welcome that. However, the house and emissions continue to rise. Doesn't this show that there's more work for us to do on insulating our homes, particularly in rural areas? The route map for energy efficient Scotland published last month didn't suggest anything to address the unique rural housing problems. Will the government heed this parliament's target for an EPCC target and increase capital investment in home and energy efficiency? Cameron well, you know, this is not, again, uh, my portfolio area, but the uh, route map for energy efficient Scotland, which was published on the 2nd of May, sets out our vision for all buildings in Scotland. Uh, and for Scotland's homes, we propose that by 2040, all homes are improved so that they achieve at least an energy performance certificate rating of band C, where technically feasible and cost effective. And Emma Harper. Cabinet Secretary may be aware that there are effective solutions and efficient measures to reduce wasteful and harmful emissions from cattle and sheep and also slurry. So such solutions are available in the form of yeast and also bacterial based products. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what plans does she have to enlist the expertise of farm industry specialists to support further agricultural emissions reduction and continue our progress towards a low carbon economy? This is an area that we are addressing through the agricultural chapter of the Climate Change Plan, uh, specifically Policy Outcome 4. There are numerous options on the market, um, and earlier this year, Climate Exchange did publish a report commissioned by the Scottish Government and produced by Ricardo Energy and Environment entitled Reduced Emissions from the use and storage of manure and sl slurry, uh, which would seem to be absolutely on point uh, with what the member is asking about. The, the report does look at the options available to Scottish farmers, will help to inform discussions, and if she isn't uh, or hasn't been already aware of it, uh, I would commend it to her. Point of order, oh. Mr Stevenson. Uh, I omitted to draw members' attention to my register of interest in relation to a small shareholding in a wind farm. Thank you, Mr Stevenson. You have now corrected oh. that. Uh, thank you. That concludes our uh, statement on Greenhouse gas emissions will now move on to the next item of business, which is a statement by Shirley Ann Somerville on student support. And again, the Minister will take questions at the end of her statement. I would encourage members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. <laughs> 